So thank you for joining us here on the opening day of, day of water. Um, and the discussion today between the artists and myself is all about traditional responses to contemporary problems. So the water exhibition, as you've seen, as you've walked through, it highlights the scarcity of this precious resource with artwork by Australian and international artists. And hopefully it'll spark conversations about the environmental and social challenge challenges we face today. Throughout our discussion, though, today, we will focus on how traditional indigenous knowledge about our land, seas and environment can help us tackle the climate and sustainability challenges faced here and overseas. We'll be highlighting the importance of engaging First Nations voices in climate discourse uh, and considering the role that art and artists can play in communicating these stories. Today I'm joined by three artists included in the, in the water exhibition. Megan Cope, Kwanda Mooka woman hailing from Minjeriba, North Stradbroke Island. Nicole Forshu, a Wiradjuri woman from the central west of New South Wales. And Judy Watson, Wanyi artist who lives and works in Mianjin here in Brisbane. We are joined by an Auslan interpreter, two Auslan interpreters in fact, uh, and today's program is being recorded uh, for my show, Away, for broadcast in 2020. Please join me, though, in welcoming our guests. And I'd like to ask each of you to talk about your country in relation to this topic, precisely where it is, uh, talk about the water sources on that country, is that water, are those water sources flourishing, uh, is your country in drought, um, and how, how are communities suffering through the scarcity of water? Megan, first to you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I too would just like to pay my respects um, to my elders and acknowledge um, my Kwanamooka families that are here. Um, thank you, Geraldine, for um, making such an incredible exhibition for us. So, for those of you who don't know, um, our Kwanamooka country is connected by this body of water out um, into Moreton Bay. And um, yeah, so we are saltwater people, Yuli Boba, people of the sand and um, sea. And we have a lot of fresh water um, on our country, a lot of swamps and freshwater springs, um, but uh, so much of our um, life and story does rely on healthy saltwater country. Um, one of the most incredible um, facts about um, Kabora in particular, which is a deep um, water uh, lake, is that the pH hasn't changed for seven and a half thousand years um, and it's one of the only water bodies in Australia that um, has, I guess, uh, what scientists label um, is a climate refuge um, because of that um, stability in the water. So it's uh, very, very important, that body of water. Um, and yeah, it's, it's due to the strict laws um, of our people why that water has been protected. Um, currently, we are seeing a lot of the swamps and um, perch lakes drying up. It's quite alarming, um, a lot of Elders and community members are concerned about that. Nicole, your country, what are the water sources on your country? Are they flourishing? They're not flourishing. Mm. Um, Yarra do Marang, and thank you for your welcome. Um, an acknowledgement of country. Um, so I'm originally from Peak Hill. Um, yeah, Bulgandra mine, which is a mission. My grandfather was born on the river. He was born on the Bogan River. Um, and there's a stump there to memorialise his... Um, he was one of the last elders to, um, to be born there on the river. So the river is a really important place and not far from Peak Hill, about 90 kilometres inland into Dubbo, it's predicted that water will run out in the town supply by December 2019. It's not widely reported, but there are many people that are talking about this. So Bruce Shillingsworth, he's looking at different projects, um, in particular the Yamagana Barker project. He's seeking government and decision makers to wake up 
and start to acknowledge the problems that we are facing and also the change. He's asking us to sing and to dance and to summons rain. That's what's happening in our country. In fact, we saw that on the weekend with the Dance Nation. Um, this incredible movement of, of blackfellas all over the country. We just got out and danced wherever we were and um, in, in some places it did produce rain. So uh, it was an incredible moment. Judy, what about those water sources on your country? Well, one year people are known as running water people. Running water people. Yeah. And beautiful subterranean water. It emerges from a huge basin in the Barclay Tablelands and it takes million of, millions of years for the water to come up through tiny fissures in the limestone. And by the time it pops up on the surface of, you know, Bujamala, Lawn Hill Gorge, it could be the same water that dinosaurs were drinking. So it's incredible and it's rich and it's feeding the country. However, uh, there are certain creeks in the area. Louis Creek is one of them, really important creek, uh, ancestral creek. And I remember seeing um, water spirals of, you know, freshwater springs emerging from there back in 1990 when I was there with my family. And that was when I was making a lot of work about this and still do. That's the wellspring for my work. But going back there last year, the creek's just about dry and the springs are not operating. Uh, some of the work I've, I've been looking at, working with Michelle Hobbs, who's an Indigenous um, artist and water scientist, is looking at... Um, what's happening and all across the Gulf country back in the 1800s 80 percent of the springs that were operating then um, are now dry they're no longer operating and um, my grandmother was say, asking her mother about a place at Lilydale Springs when she was a child they used to go there and she said how are the springs now or you know how's Lilydale Springs and her grandmother said the rainbow dried it up but in fact it wasn't the rainbow it was a pastoralist on the property who had dynamited the springs trying to get more water out, and the rainbow meaning ancestral rainbow serpent, Bujamala. Well, that's shocking because, you know, in your work, water's been a constant theme. It's always a recurring theme. I wonder if you could just um, explain how perhaps in the work, Wanami? Yeah. Um, Wanami is the word for water. So that's a one, one, of the, one of the words, yeah. yeah, in our so language. So maybe could you talk about that work in relation to the overall uh, thesis of this exhibition? Sure. Um, so the, it's a very ethereal sort of work. It's like the idea of being underwater looking up or looking down with light hitting the water, reflections of it. And then it's got these forms floating through it, which could be hair string, you know, which is made, you know, gathered from the hair. Um, and then sort of you imagine that contains the hair follicles rolled along the leg, uh, which then is picking up, you know, sort of all the skin, and hair and sweat and dust, and then it's woven and then it's worn on the body. So all of those people all along the way who that hair has sort of connected to, it's carrying those old people in those objects. So when I see anything to do with hair in uh, museum collections, I think those people are there. Those old people are hiding in that hair. And so that's twisting through and it's really looking at the resonance uh, of those those objects quivering in the water, but also showing resilience and strength of, I'm saying Aboriginal women, because that's my matrilineal side of my family, um, moving through. And the twisting forms um, could also be, um, you know, when you see water and you see the ripples and the shadows moving through, it's quite sinuous. That could also be the ancestral Bujamala rainbow serpent in there. I just have to say there is a shadow in the bottom right too, which is really talking about the poison which is leaking into our water sources, the contaminants from agricultural runoff, pesticides, um, you know, domestic use, industrial use, and of course uh, the issue with mining, which is leaching and you know all the bores going through country and just taking our water away. Nicole, could you perhaps talk about um, your work, which is beautiful, um, these beautiful um, uh, sticks which have been encrusted through a natural process with... Talk about, talk about that work. 
So, um, Nair is a, a long time. It's um, sacred. So the works take um, a really long time to form. Um, but they're sacred acts, I think, and they're indicators of change. So they're buried deep in the Earth's atmosphere. They're accelerated by use of water. And as a result, the objects are, re they're kind of revelations, really. They really connect to Wiradjuri philosophy. Um, they connect to religion. Um, I'm very much attached to them. <laughs> um, they're very fragile, but they also hold a lot of weight and a lot of knowledge. Um, I think that they demonstrate really an acquired knowledge of country. The fact that I can use these minerals and materials. I know where to collect those branches from the high ground to the low ground. I take them to a place that's a very special place for women. It's all about the act of engaging with land and with country. And for as long as I keep doing that, I'm sustained. And they also have the potential for healing. So thank you, Geraldine, for having the works here. Um, yeah, and to have it amongst such beautiful artworks like Judy and, and Megan. Um, the materiality in this exhibition really speaks of that philosophy and, and knowledge and deep understanding of what the meaning is of water. And, and water really is life. It's life. I do want to talk about unsustainable artistic practices, but your, the, could you just maybe describe what you do in, that, in, in, in making those objects or allowing them to kind of be created? What you do, you, you plant them in, in the earth and water them. So it's a conceptual, um, it's conceptual and it's also science, um, it's also recipes um, and ingredients. But ultimately, they're the raw material. So we talk about the knowledge of, of how to find that particular material that grows naturally. Um, gypsum, for example, as well as salt. And I'm accelerating those processes that naturally occur in our atmosphere. And I think when we're able to extract what's actually happening under the surface of where we walk and have a look at that and, and have a bit of a revelation that underneath us is a really long time and it's a, a, and it's a formation of that time. Um, and I'm really, really interested in what happens underneath that surface and it takes a long time. So patience, um, allowing the earth and the atmosphere, you know, wet and dry lands, um, the air, salt water, fresh water, all of these elements have some relationship to each other to enable them to, to um, metamorphose into these objects. And they're not just physical objects too, they're, as I was talking, that they're conceptual in their ability to then be used in the mineral con content um, to re relieve and revive the body. Um, and in traditional practices, some of those materials were used in ceremony in mourning, um, and so they're very important material. And I've worked um, a lot with museum collections um, where I've been able to see um, mineralogists in the early prospect days um, of particular rare earth minerals, and Dubbo and Peak Hill in particular have very, very important rare earth materials that aren't really known, but are sourced through prospectors, through electronics, devices, um, NASA. There's a whole lot of research in the area that I come from and, and, and the earth materials that are there, and they're very, very rare. Yeah. So Nicole's work is kind of in here, uh, along with Judy's in, that, uh, in, in there, in that cavern. Um, but Megan's work, Megan, can you talk about that? It's the first work you see as you enter the gallery. And I've seen that work before, but yes. this is another installation of that work. Yeah. Um, so, actually, you know, our country is very rich in um, minerals as well. And um, so, um, our country has been mined for a long time um, for silica and um, rutile, um, ilmenite, um, 
yeah, mineral sands, basically. Um, so actually, this work uh, was prompted by, um, you know, the closing of the mine and the future of our country, um, economic future. Um, and so I wanted to think uh, more deeply into deeper sense of time and actually look deeper into the colonial history and on our country. Um, and talk about the mining of our um, Aboriginal middens and shell piles, um, which were a necessary material um, uh, for the settlers um, to build the foundations of the city. So actually, um, that's uh, how I started to, um, you know, talk about that um, on our country. So first, I wanted to um, connect shells with um, concrete um, to kind of, you know, tell that story of this material um, and object and connect it to a solid foundation. But um, what I found um, with the dialogues that occurred was that people didn't really know um, what middens were. So I decided I um, had to become more explicit with the form. So what we see out there is like 12,000 um, concrete shells um, lodged in black beauty copper slag, and slag is uh, the end of the mining process. So um, for me, this work is like full cycle of the start and the end of mining, hopefully, in and my mind, <laughs> hopefully in our world. But I mean, you created an object of beauty, um, which reminds, which can remind us of that whole process. Mm. But they were mining the middens, um, and, they, and the islands had massive structures, you know. Um, the ancestors were, you know, mindful enough to put the shells at the same spot and then to create... I've seen photographs from the 19th century um, of the midden, midden, middens on the islands. Um, they were architectural. Absolutely, and that's what I've been wanting to um, kind of illustrate in, um, in the scale um, of, of the first few iterations I had were quite small, um, but then I wanted to, yeah, bring that up so that we could actually start to um, understand the scale of um, what our middens were um, prior to their desecration. And I think it's really important to understand that um, after, the, after our shell piles were mined, um, the colonisers then also resorted to scraping live um, shells off um, our oyster reefs and also burning coral as well. And what also occurred um, on land was um, deforestation um, to fuel the kilns to burn the shell. So, you know, basically, and people come to our country all the time and they think it's the most beautiful place on earth, and it is. But, you know, the reality is our oyster reefs are 90% extinct. And, you know, um, yeah, everything has actually changed quite a lot. Um, and, yeah, so this work has been um, quite emotional for me. It's been a big learning. Um, what I thought was just a simple reaction has actually taught me so much. Um, and connected me so much to um, our history. Um, and actually, I've also learnt that um, this is echoed throughout Australia, everywhere. So what happened on Nagoon, St Helena, which is what it's called here, um, to connect to that specific history. Um, when it was in Sydney, it was Dubba Gully, to connect to that site, um, to kind of remind people that this is um, a repetition, and it's part of the colonial project. So the middens were mined for lime production, so they could use lime in, in cement. I think John Mundine has actually pointed out that in Sydney, you know, um, there were bones and middens at, at the same sites, and it's kind of potent to think that the bones of our ancestors, um, as well as shells, uh, exist in those very old buildings. It's a, the kind of entire circle. Mm. It's uh, pretty haunting, actually. Yeah. Um, I guess I want to make the point that 
You know when your life depends on understanding the ebbs and flows of water sources, uh, of gain, you, you kind of learn what you need to survive. You, 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 you have to know that information. It's vital to your survival. Um, you don't overfish, uh, you don't harvest too much, um, and you don't irrigate. But um, Judy, in relation to your country, where, you know, which is quite heavily mined and farmed, what kind of, I know that your mum had some notes about what you were going to say today, but what were what was some of her, some of the things she wanted to, to point out about uh, sustainability and life um, on Wani country? Uh, well, she was just saying that um, people would move according to seasonal produce, so you wouldn't stay in the one place and over you know, sort of harvest. You would harvest when the wild oranges were in season and then you'd move to another place when there was another fruit coming on. And so it just meant that you had a whole lot of country to move across. You know, there'd be the freshwater mus mussel shells, malamu, um, and nothing would be over harvested. So that's, that's sustainability and that's what we're not doing here in Australia. So the kind of rotation of crops. Yes. So when the wild orange is coming on, then yeah. you harvest that, and then you, when something else, the burdock and plums are um, coming on, you harvest that. Yeah. Middens, middens are really important maps in that way. Um, archaeologists look at those to not only, um, you know, find out how long we've stayed in our homelands, but also, um, yeah, actually they're incredible indicators on how sophisticated our land management is. You, c you can actually see cycles in those layers, really sophisticated. And there's also this other idea that I think is quite um, relevant, and that is, uh, Nicole, that the health of a river system or a watercourse on your country is, you know, it can be equated with the health of a community, uh, their well-being, all the communities they support. Would you agree with that, that statement? Yeah, I do. And um, can you, is that on? Yeah, sorry. Um, I think what we're talking about is, you know, past practices and like the colonial impact is huge. So colonisation has created an enormous disadvantage for Aboriginal people. It's disempowered and dispossessed Aboriginal people and in communities in regional and rural and remote New South Wales, communities are affected. Bree Warrena, Wool Kenya, Menindi, Peak Hill. They're being asked to move out of their communities and their country because they're running out of water. Bruce Shillingsworth says that this water has been stolen Bruce says that it is the corruption of our government and it is colonisation that has made our river dry. And this is happening now. It's not in the past. The impacts of colonisation are still impacting us and our communities because of that story, because of that narrative. And so I think it's really, really important that when we look at our artwork, while we may not necessarily directly reference that, like over time, those works become the repositories of what is happening at that time. Mm. So my works are beautiful, they are sacred, but they're also made in a place not that long ago, a couple of years ago, and it references what's ha actually happening now and what's affecting young people and old people. They're very much contemporary, contemporary works. Um, Megan, I was talking to Badger Bates, who's a Barkindji man, um, activist and water activist from Western New South Wales. Uh, he's very strong on the fish kills, the water crisis, has been talking about the health of the river, the Barker, the Darling River for years. Um, but he says something like, you know, Barker is the, is, the, is the name of the Darling River. So the Barkindji, when they have no river, when the river dries up, um, because the river defines who they are, they lose their identity. So if they can't keep the river safe, um, they're not Barkindji. I mean, that's something I think about too, being freshwater and saltwater, like I'm dependent on, on those waters. When I see erosion happening uh, on the beach at Fingal, I'm just like, what's going to happen to me? 
I've got no, I've got no soul, I've got no identity. Is that something that you, could, you can kind of uh, empathise with? Oh, absolutely. And this is our country. This is... We don't have anywhere else to go, really, you know. Um, and I, I don't want to um, think about having to be refugees. We are already accommodating so many peoples on our countries, you know, and we are trying to remind people um, of, you know, how to respect country. We're finally at a stage where we're, we can speak freely without, um, well, some of us can um, speak freely without retribution or, um, you know, serious punishment in the way that um, older generations have. So it's like time now to get it right. We all have a responsibility to do things proper way, our way. Um, it's time to think about concepts of sovereignty for water, changing the legal status of water bodies, extending rights. You know, this is, this is the way our old people maintained their cultures, our countries, and kept them in pristine conditions for millennia. So I just, you know, I, I want to I see more of that. I think you're probably more articulate than I am. Um, I actually am feeling really emotional um, being back in Brisbane and feeling this heat and the smoke, it's very overwhelming. It's not what I want to come home to. It's real. Yeah, in fact, um, coming from Sydney, um, we've been blanketed in smoke haze for weeks. Um, you know, places all over this country, not just experiencing smoke haze, they're experiencing fires. Um, but it does kind of bring home um, when you've got large population centres experiencing something like the climate, climate emergency. And I think it can act uh, as a bit of a catalyst to changing people's minds about the climate emergency. Um, Megan, you were talking about the sovereignty of water, which I'm fascinated by, and the status, the, the, the status of water as a living entity. Uh, in, in Aotearoa, at the, um, the Wanganui Iwi, the, the clan of, the, of Wanganui, uh, obtained these rights for the Wanganui River. And uh, the lead negotiator in that claim for special uh, status for the Wanganui River, a man called Jared Albert said, we have fought to find an approximation in law so that all others can understand from, that from our perspective, treating the river as a living entity is the correct way to approach it as an indivisible whole instead of the traditional model for the last 100 years of treating it from a perspective of ownership and management. Um, and I would think that any kind of protection that we can extend to bodies of water like that one out there um, should be something that we should attempt. Sorry? Uh, Friends of the Thames uh, g gave it that status, living body of water. The Thames River in London. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. One of the things I've learned about this artwork um, and using concrete is that concrete is an extremely problematic material. It requires so much water and, you know, um, we're obsessed with it and it was kind of strange to me but I felt like I really needed to do that because that's, you know, I need to talk to non-Aboriginal people about things so we use material to communicate this because these materials are so um, critical and important in that translation. But what's been really interesting um, now is that I never want to make another concrete oyster again. <laughs> Not because it takes a long time but because now that work has taught me it's time to rebuild the oyster reefs. It's time to return back to that um, task and um, you know, rebuild, that, um, rebuild those reefs so that the water that flows in here will be cleaner. You know, and that when, when it rains, that Kinyanyara can clean the water for everybody. Those Oyster reefs provide the foundations of all life in the ocean. And Judy, I think, I think your mum had some uh, 
some suggestions about how you oxygenate the water. Oh, I think I was thinking about that, yeah. Um, so rather than redirecting water in a straight line, if it's allowed to follow its memory, you know, water has a memory, mm -hmm. and the original path and sort of, you know, going into the dips and the valleys and have the boulders and the reeds and the grasses, that creates the oxygenation which um, introduces life into the river, which it, it has. But if you take that away, that's when you get the acidification um, occurring, you get, um, you, you know, sort of really bad, you know, the salts, everything's sort of leaching into it. So it's really important to sort of um, encourage the life in the river by um, sustainable practice. And many people know that, you know, sort of both uh, Aboriginal people and um, farmers, you know, who have really looked up uh, about this. And there's a whole lot of, you know, sort of practice where you can see healthy practice recreating healthy growth within the country. So it's just a matter of following that and not going, looking at long-term gains, not short-term gains. Mm. And do you think that idea of, the, of bodies of water as living entities is something that we should, we should be considering here? I mean, I, would, I can't imagine that it would ever um, be endorsed at a kind of commonwealth or state level, but protect, extending protection for bodies of water Ab in the same way do national parks. Ab absolutely. You know, sort of uh, Indigenous people had so many um, rules about, you know, how you treated water and where, you know, so you wouldn't be going in and... Actually, the first time I went to Bujamala Lawn Hill Gorge, I saw that there was pig kills, you know, people had been pig shooting and all of this desecration was right next to the water. We can imagine, you know, how destructive that is and people going to the toilet or washing their clothes even on a domestic basis. So it's not just industrial, it's domestic, it's, you know, contamination, it's, um, you know, when uh, mining is taking water, trucking water to wash coal, and yet communities, local communities, have no water. And seeing, you know, what's happened with Menindi and, um, you know, all of those places along the Barker, being at Broken Hill and just, the water tastes horrible. You know, I rem I, re I rem well, sorry, but you know, I remember, you know, going to Tambo when we would go through in other places too, and a lot of that water really doesn't taste good um, when it's depleted. And it's, you know, it's really important to look after it because it's so precious and so beautiful when it's healthy. Um, I know, I, I Megan... Also, sorry, I also sorry. think that everybody knows that um, water is a living entity. Mm -hmm. You know that, you feel it when you go into the water, when you submerge yourself, and it's a matter of actually taking it that on and just feel, um, feeling what's in your heart and your body and how water is a conduit. So as long as you can sort of like take off uh, the political sort of, you know, um, gaze and actually think about it in terms of how it's going to sustain you and its richness for you as an you know, a really important source of life, as we were saying, if everybody takes that on and saves their shower water and puts it in the garden, etc., that's really important. Um, Nicole, I think, you know, in relation to, to your work, um, and also like what's happening in the, throughout the Murray-Darling Darling Basin and the mismanagement of the entire system, um, you know, water's being sold to the highest bidder, not just in Western New South Wales, but much over much of the country. Uh, water licenses are going for a lot of money. Uh, and they're trucking water into Menindee and from Bro and pi I'm thinking about a pipeline from Broken Hill. I mean, what do you see when you go, when you're on country? Well, I see that there's a lot of modification through land, but not just um, like water. I did write some notes about how I felt about how we classify land, um, which is interesting. It's um, also the varied competition. It's not just mining, it's residential, it's commercial, it's pastoral, it's agricultural. There's a lot going on, it's very layered. And so I think about technology too. I also think about um, innovation, I think about how we could do things differently. And there is land and water rights. 
and the outstation movement in Northern Territory and in Western Australia in the late 70s and 80s have proven that the competing agenda for land for Aboriginal people and to be able to live on country has a huge impact on your health and your well-being and your ability to be able to access your material for your art, for your culture and for who you are. So when I drive through to a central western New South Wales and I think what it would be like to have the majority of my country as my outstation where I collect my material and I harvest what I need, that is incredibly powerful. Bulgandra mine was one of the first native title claims that were handed back to my family. We do go out there regularly and it is on that river, but there's a lot of space in between Bogan River, Dubbo and other places. And what would that mean to be in an outstation, to live there, to be sustainable? And where, where I live now, where we live, um, the, our body of water is the drinking water that we have. We pump our water from our creek. We're not on town water. So we're very conscious of how much we drink. It's not an unlimited source where you turn the tap on and you, it's just unlimited resource. We pump from the water, which is now being redirected to, to fire um, and to combat the fires that surround us all. Um, there's competing agenda for land and competing agenda for water. And I think it's time to recognise the opportunity that we have, not just through exhibition, not just artists, but the sophisticated conversation that people as decision makers can have with Aboriginal people, with people who understand land and understand that knowledge, people who live on the land and what they can bring to the conversation to support better decision making, grown up decisions that can support us to be sustainable if we choose to live in that way. We don't want to go live in towns and cities. We want to be on country. And we can learn a lot from Northern Territory and Western Australia in that outstation movement that still sustains them. They have cultural centres that are in their communities. They have art centres that support their economic development and art is a big part of that. Megan, I know that during the fires on um, Morton Island, some of the mob were saying that if they'd been permitted to practice their own uh, burning, uh, it might have prevented the emergency. Uh, and I think just very recently, the Kwandamooka were recognised as the traditional owners of the island. And the mob were very quick to say that following that consent determination in the federal court, that they would be implementing their traditional fire management practices. I mean, we have to see the relationship between, you know, bushfires, uh, very damaging, big bushfires that merge, um, and the climate emergency. You can say that the climate crisis doesn't cause bushfires, um, but one little thing in the environment can make those bushfires much bigger. That's right. Um, see, the thing is right now, you know, our country isn't just in drought, it's like bone dry because of the government's relationship or, or you know, um, attitude on water as a f this thing that is just never ending, right? It should be illegal to mine water. It's not right. We know that. You know, the case in Mich Michigan, um, Auntie was saying earlier, like I don't know if people know, but, you know, the little town of Michigan actually had a small victory recently where they were able to challenge Nestle um, and stop them from, what was it, what's it called? They wanted to claim that uh, bottled water is an essential public service. It was rejected. Um, they wanted to um, increase the amount of water pumped from 250 gallons per minute to 400 gallons. You know, this should be illegal. It's, yes, we, when we're on our country, and we have access to our lands, and we can maintain those deep relationships with our country, with our people, with, with, and you know, manage those complex ecosystems. Yes, we can prevent fires, we can do this, but right now, this is a, um, what we're seeing is really, really critically linked to water and lack of. Well, I think Nestle wanted to um, take Osceola's 
uh, water supply, Osceola, a little town in Michigan, in the United States, um, to bottle it at, for profit, um, but the town managed to uh, obtain an injunction stopping Nestle from, from doing that. I mean, we do see that with corporations, with um, big business, agribusiness, um, and big pastoral um, landholders. We're, we're seeing it sort of, um, and hearing about it, you know, sort of just around Springbrook and places yeah. like that. And they're trucking water out, and people are saying the, the falls and the creeks are really running dry because people are filling up, you know, for water containers. Springbrook yeah. in the Gold Coast yeah, hinterland. Yeah, all in the, the hinterland there. And then, of course, you've got the Galilee Basin, yeah. where water is uh, <laughs> proposed to be given away to billionaires you know, uh, whether it's um, Adani or Gina Reinhardt or Clive Palmer, given away, uh, why don't we have rights as people, all of us, mm. and why doesn't water have rights? Mm. Why are we giving it away? Yeah. It does not make sense. Do we wait? Like, I mean, you know, the thing is, ideally, we create, um, we work with lawyers to create these legislations, right, so that these um, rights can be extended to these living entities, the bodies of water. But, I mean, you know, I'm kind of feeling like there's not really that much time. Like, maybe we have to um, take that responsibility, you know? Maybe we have to... It's on us to educate ourselves and connect with Aboriginal people um, where you live, you know? Educate yourself and, and take that responsibility more, like you were saying. Well, I think, you know, in, in according um, the legal status or protection to a river, um, in a kind of Western sense, uh, it's kind of gilding the lily, because for us, the water's already sacred, um, the land is already sacred. Um, maybe talk about that, Nicole, that, you know, we already have this mindset that we're dependent on country for survival, culturally, yeah. physically. And I think that's a really good point because I guess even in the making of Nair is the opportunity to connect that relationship with country but also language and the importance of have, having language and that reclamation of language and being able to title my work and to understand its significance in language. Um, the sacredness of water is very real, um, not just from where I am, um, but also the, for the ability to heal and the ability to be able to understand the, the deep meaning and connection. And it is, we, we are country, like language, and our contemporary repositories of art are our connection and they are our future. So I think contemporary art, um, art and your ability to, well, in my case, for my practice, it relies on the environment. It relies on my ability to access that knowledge, the deep knowledge that's required to understand where you get this material from. And as I mentioned before, um, that is what sustains who I am. So the act of engaging in that environment is really important. And I just wanted to say re really quickly that where the fires are burning in New South Wales is deep country. And there is, in my understanding and my belief, a little engagement. If we have national parks and wildlife and government authorities responsible for engaging in our country, what are they? How do they do that? And how do we work together to ensure it is engaged? They're not preserved. They're not someone closing the door or locking a gate and say that we're preserving this place for future generations. It is on fire. And they are ancestral trees. They are ancestral elements of our ecosystem that is currently being disrupted. And we may not even fully comprehend what the loss is. And I equate loss, because I don't think we're just going through a climate change. This is a cultural change, a cultural and climate crisis. Our culture is written in that land, and it is on fire. The National Park in the Blue Mountains, 
is World Heritage listed? Why? And what is the plan for engaging in that? And who is responsible? And this is the conversation that we could be having with very um, amazing, intelligent people who understand country and learn. And in Gidja country, in Warman, in Western Australia, the Gidja Rangers go out, they fly in a helicopter. They're in country for weeks on end, not preserving or closing a gate, but engaging in their country. They're keeping it alive, they're employed to do it, and they have the support to do it. Why can't we have that here? Why can't we have that in New South Wales? Why are we so reliant on government authorities or why are we reliant on them to, to assume that they're doing what we understand is what we think is right? But, we, you know, why, oh, I just sort of think um, we should, they should be getting fined. You know, why can't we issue eviction notices and ch fine them for mismanagement of our country? It's getting to the point now where it's not just, yeah, it's not, it's all of us that are implicated in this, you know. Um, and we were talking about, you know, collective responsibility. Um, in this kind of world that we live in, um, you're responsible for your country, you're also responsible for, for other people's country. Talk a little bit about, you know, your sense of collective responsibility uh, in this uh, kind of current state that we're in. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, I live on, um, you know, Wurundjeri country, actually. Um, even there, I just try my best to be awake and watching and making sure that I'm aware of what I do um, and to reduce, I don't know, just to, yeah, just to be mindful, I guess. But when I was home for six months last year, you know, I really felt like, um, our country was so is so alive. Every day, I, I, like every day, I stop. I just use plastic less and less. When the tide goes out, we collect it. It's really, really interesting um, how um, I felt guided in what the right thing to do was, even though um, you know no one had taught me. I think that the long, the language of the land is very, very strong if you listen. Um, and also, yeah. I can't remember what you asked me, but... Um, <laughs> Collective responsibility. Yeah. When you, are, you know, what kind of a guest are you when you go on to, into somebody else's house? You know, I think that these are the ways we need to think about when we're on other people's country and in each other's houses. And, you know, be empathetic, take responsibility. You can't look to the government. They're proving themselves to be no marker of how to do these things. I think they've taken resources. They've taken resources from the environment. They've taken resources from Indigenous rangers. And that's where we, we have to be uh, mindful and pushing for the money to go back into those areas again. I mean, here we are with art and transport. <laughs> that's yeah. us now. Yeah. Um, you know, it's sort of like the environment and, and logging together or, you know, forestry or whatever. So we just have to be mindful and uh, pushing, even though I know it's not just government, it's us, but we also do need to push and, and check, say, where's the money for the environment within this region and where's the money for in Indigenous rangers to work together? You're talking about the um, decision to collapse the Department of Arts, um, yes. the former Federal Arts Department, into one for infrastructure and transport. Mm. I mean, it does kind of suggest a way of thinking about art um, and creativity, which is, you know, if you want to talk about it, it actually does generate a lot of profit. It does generate a lot of income for a lot of people. Yeah. So it's interesting to think that in the, just in these last few days, that decision has been made. It's quite um, startling. But Megan, one of your countrywomen, um, the very learned, distinguished Professor Aileen Morton Robinson, talks about um, this kind of tendency to, to take, um, she calls it possessive or extractive mm. logic. Um, and the idea is, I guess, is this kind of you know, paradox or a dilemma that we have in this country, uh, present also in the invasion of the, of the continent. 
And that is if a resource like water um, or forests or um, middens, if it's available and it's not being exploited for economic profit, you just take it. So that's a kind of way of thinking that has structured you know, the entire um, the nation state. In Western logic, exactly. So, but I, I, I don't know, maybe it's actually a positive thing that the, um, we've, we no longer have um, an art department in government because, you know, like I've been wondering, how do I, or how do we rebuild the oyster reefs um, and disguise it as art? Perhaps we can use this new <laughs> direction um, because, I mean, really, like, you think you have to understand that the colonial project's primary function is to eliminate all living things on Earth. Like, it's proving itself that's the thing that drives it and motivates it, and that's the result of it as it moves across the land, you know, into the substrata, everywhere it goes. It leaves a trail of death, right? Christo's got his floating island, so you could have your floating oyster reefs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, can we use art as an excuse to replenish, um, you know, our water bodies, to regenerate? Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of artists, there's a lot of important work, you know. There's quite a few of us in this show. Um, there's massive movements that are occurring um, where artists are, and community people are disguising these practices as art and it's bringing us together, it's teaching us, um, you know, how to talk to each other, how to learn from each other um, and it's defying that possessive logic that Aunty Aileen talks about um, so powerfully and it's really critical reading to then, you know, move into other spaces of creativity. And possessive logic holds that you can redirect rivers, you can control the flows, um, you can kind of manage the cycles of nature. Can I, um, just, can I just say, during colonisation, our water holes were deliberately poisoned. Now, there is still poisoning going on, so we have to think about it and think, is this a deliberate act of sabotage to this living entity? You know, when you've got runoff going from industrial or, you know, mine sources or, you know, air force bases or whatever it is, or is it something... Once again, is it something where those, those people responsible should be under our watch and actually charged for it? So that everybody's responsible. Mm. Well, there are consequences, you know? Yeah, absolutely, And then opportunity for us to be able to rehabilitate and, and return yeah. things to, to, the, to the proper laws. Nicole, you wanted to mention in or on country mitigation versus Preservation? Yeah, well, I was just um, thinking about, you know, when we're saying we want to be accountable, and I think we are now. But when you think about mitigation versus preservation and what that actually means, and when I talk briefly about engaging in different parts of country, whether it's isolated, uh, we're seeing the ramifications of that now and what our understanding is and our country, or in-country, is making us accountable. And I've, I've said it a couple of times because it's on fire. <laughs> I mean, it literally is, uh, in itself, having to manage and deal with that without any interaction or engagement, if that makes sense. I don't know if I answered that. <laughs> but I, I'm just curious about the difference between mitigation versus preservation. They're two, two different ways of thinking about our responsibilities to well, the environment. I think mitigation is, um, I think, I don't want to get into like, some, like you know, wordplay and everything like that, but I think it's a form of lowering risk. Mm. Um, you know, and preservation is potentially um, preserve or like work around so that it's continued. Mm -hmm. But I think we just have to really think differently on how we're able to do that. And I talked about, you know, the cultural change as a climate change, and, and artists were really good at doing that. We're really, really good at... Um, and our artworks become these um, identifiers. We become the indicators of that change because of what we're using in our materiality, on what we have access to, what we want to talk about um, in terms of the concept. Um, and certainly this work has taken a very long time to make um, and I've chosen 
the rawest form of materiality. And that in itself is a concept that I have access to, that I'm commenting about. That ability and, like I talked about, that deep knowledge to be able to understand that process of that mineral, that raw material, is in a sense comparing or um, competing with the idea of mining, isn't it? There's um, cement up down in um, New South Wales out near Lithgow where artists go and work in communities and maybe artists can go and work in communities where communities are trying to uh, make fracking, for example, um, accountable where, you know, it's leading to contamination of water. And I know we've got, like, the Environmental Dis Defenders Organisation and people like that, but I think artists could come in and mm. also support those communities too. I do wonder about the sustainable practice of some art making and yeah. some, some of the work in this exhibition makes me think about how I'm not sh quite sure if that's sustainable. Mm. There's a snowman in a refrigerator just over there <laughs> and I wonder about how much energy he's sucking up and um, the rocks in that incredibly beautiful work. Mm. But I do think, yeah, what's, what's the impact of, uh, of everything that we do? Um, here in this image over here, on the wall of a glacier, a man on a glacier with a blowtorch, I mean, he's, he's, the point he's trying to make is that uh, individual action has consequences. Yes. But I do wonder sometimes, it's that thing about the message and the medium. I mean, it's constant negotiation, but I think there, there are ways we can make our, our practice sustainable. And building that oyster reef there on the island would be, would be something you could do. Yeah, yeah. Do you I think about sustainability in your practice? Absolutely, like, especially after living on country for six months for the first time in my life and being there every day and time, my whole sense of time, everything changing. Like that has, um, yeah, that has really, really shaped me and the future and the direction of my work in ways I did not expect and I really, I really love that actually. I'm, I'm very um, grateful to my country for teaching me that. Um, and yeah, I don't, I'm not going to be using concrete in this way again. Um, I think that we do also have to acknowledge um, that the issues that we are discussing are deeply patriarchal um, and we have to identify that in order to um, uh, create new strategies um, and resolution. And, um, I think, you know, it's good, it's interesting if we're going to kind of analyse or have a little critique there, like um, if, you know, we're looking at um, Judy's practice and Nicole's practice, like they're in, in complete contrast to the other works that you mentioned. So, yeah, there's a really interesting, um, I yeah. think that that's important to note. It's a really important kind of what would seem to be a subtext, but it's actually very, quite pronounced. Yeah. The difference between the art um, a patriarch might make um, and the one who believes in a more matriarchal society. Any final comments, Nicole, before we, before we wrap up? Um, I think I've said a lot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I've certainly questioned a lot, um, and isn't that what we're all here to do? Um, and in a place that is safe and uh, relatively safe, um, I'm going to be able to get out here. <laughs> Everyone's not offended by what I said. Yeah, we haven't made it out yet. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, thank you, and thank you for listening. And Judy, one thing before you go, I just want to quickly pick up on something you said about the memory of water. Could you just finish on something about water has a memory? Oh, uh, yeah. I wanted to um, just read this beautiful quote from a scientist, uh, Della Prasoli, who says, uh, somehow water forces us to go deeper than familiar adversarial positions and confront what we really share this instinct to life. Water carries a symbolic and subconscious power which is coupled to this fear and instinct. And water, in effect, constantly calls us to higher notions of social integration and connection. And I think about that when I'm submerging myself underwater, immersing, hearing those subterranean sounds in the belly of the water. And I think if we all take that on and just sort of think, this is how we feel, this is why we should protect water, as if it's our child, you know, as important as that. It's not something over there. It's something that's within us, within our body, and it's something that we are a part of. And so we all 
Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, everybody just need to take that on and think it's the most precious jewel we have to look after.